All right. Well, welcome to our bi-monthly webinars from the Nonprofit Coach. This one for January is Creating Effective Fundraising Goals. And so we're going to go from there. I am Elizabeth Finlayson. I'm the CEO and lead coach of the Nonprofit Coach. And our mission is to create a fairer, more equitable and inclusive world filled with empathy and beauty. And we do this by supporting our nonprofit clients with strategic planning, fundraising training, and support, like we're doing today. I do want to let you know what kind of services that we do have available, and so you can kind of place these webinars within the context. We have a coaching program um, in which we can provide either 15 hours or 20 hours a year, um, where we're meeting with um, executives and development professionals and with those, we go over best fundraising practices. We look at the specific problems your organization is facing. We also do consulting on major and individual giving programs, capital campaigns, grant writing, marketing services. But there are other things like we have an online grant writing course um, on our website, the nonprofitcoach.guru. We do board trainings and retreats to get your board up to the next level. We do multi-year strategic planning. And of course, we have these free webinars and you can find um, some of them recorded on YouTube or on our website. Just also for a base, because I noticed in the um, comments afterwards sometimes, people were not sure how to place these like free bi-monthly webinars. So I'll just tell you that these are free and they were created out of the pandemic when it started. Um, I realized that me and people on our team had fundraised through multiple recessions and having done so that there was information that we knew and my terror was that we were going to lose a lot of good nonprofits and I think we have unfortunately um, but people like you have been resilient and your organizations have pulled through but we wanted to make sure that we were sharing information as quickly as possible to as many organizations as possible. We do general topic overviews, or we do deep dives into very specific topics. We often have guest speakers, but they're not meant to replace any um, regular paid coaching or training that you might do with us or anyone else. And so um, if you're looking for a little bit more, that's where you would go into deeper services. These are really just kind of more of a broad overview and kind of giving you a taste and helping you to get to the next level. All right, so we're going to start talking about fundraising goals this year. Now, you may or may not have an event, and special events do not have to be part of your fundraising mix. But the reason why this year and last year, when we went into the fundraising goals conversation, that we started by talking about special events is in the pandemic, I think you know there's a lot of extra considerations that go into planning for your event, and that really has not changed. I think we've all gotten better about planning events in the pandemic, but it's still a tricky endeavor. And we still might have situations where we can be planning and going about our business and all of a sudden our environment can change and we have to make an adjustment. So when we're thinking about our fundraising for this year, it's really important that we think about our special events. Now, before I go launching into what I think we need to be doing around special events, I do want to just check in and see, do, does anybody have a question or an event that they've been struggling with for this year that they'd like to bring for me or the group to talk about? Yeah, Elizabeth, I don't have much to talk about it, but we are planning our annual event to be in person in May and struggling with that now um, but um, starting the process anyway and hopefully before the invites have to go out it'll be a clear picture of what may will look like yeah i think that is such a great point one of the trends we're seeing with nonprofits is that they're getting really good at figuring out a mix um, so if we think about events being hybrid in this year hybrid could be some events are in person and some events are virtual the other thing, you know, that I think is here to stay right now are um, events that are themselves hybrid. So do we have some component that can be online or is online? I think for many organizations, we've realized that by having virtual and in-person events, that our in-person events were so exciting for our extroverts. 
that our extroverts love being in person and they are missing that contact. They're missing being with people. They're missing real facial expressions. They're missing touching people. And for them, there's a real feeling of deprivation. And so when you can be in person, there's a great sense of relief, even when there's a feeling of risk. For our introverts, you know, the research is showing that introverts share more um, in a virtual environment. They're more willing to speak up. Maybe there's less social information being directed at them. And so they're better able to just like focus and respond um, without feeling triggered. And so um, having both of those components either in an event or throughout your year is a great way to think about your special events. Or you can also look at um, maybe your whole event is in person, but you've got an online auction that reaches a larger audience. Or if your organization, you know, before when we were stuck with in-person events, totally, you were stuck with the people who live locally, but maybe your mission actually resonates beyond your local audience. And so maybe it's a way of getting other people involved. So it's at least um, worth thinking about what kinds of virtual components you want to put in an in-person event or what kind of in-person components you want to put in a virtual event. One of the things that was true last year and continues to be true is I really say for anyone planning a special event, please have more than one backup plan. So for instance, if you're an organization and you're planning an in-person event that's going to be outside in the summer, you're like, this is the safest way to get a lot of people together, you then need a plan for what happens if it rains. And then you need another plan for if the whole space is shut down altogether because of like a massive spike in hospitalizations. And so having more than one plan. Now, I brought that up one time and someone said, oh my gosh, it took so much to make our first plan and we did all these other backup plans and then we didn't do the other plans. And so it felt like a waste of time. It doesn't have to be that every plan has a 20 page structure behind it, but just knowing what you're going to do in each circumstance and then knowing what it is that triggers it. Is it an 8% infection rate? Is it five board members come with you in concern? Um, knowing what it is that's gonna help you decide whether you're gonna be in person or whether you're gonna be in virtual will help you because if you don't have a specific metric that says we're translating our in-person event into a virtual event, then the first time a board member comes to you and says, I'm very concerned about this, I don't think we should do this, you don't have a good answer and say, well, we're only at 5% infection rate, let's wait till we're at 8%. Um, that's, our, that's what we're gonna call it. And here's what we're gonna do if we're at 8%. So if you have something really specific to say to that person, it really will stop it from turning into a big problem. And it makes it look like you've given it some thought. You're not being callous about the numbers or not listening to people's fears, but you've got a plan. And that will really help you to keep your event in person if that's what you're looking to do. Um, but it will also help you. I was working with an organization in which say two or three people started to get deeply concerned about being in person. And if you don't wanna spend lots and lots of conversations with those people trying to convince them it's okay or going back and forth and saying, should it be virtual? Should it be in person? Should it be virtual? Already having the plan in place and saying, great, this is the metric we're going to use. This is when we know what's going to happen. Um, this is the date by which we call it. Um, all of those things will help you to just be much more powerful about an in-person event. One of the things that I really loved that's come out of these hybrid events is doing it in a smart and strategic way where if let's say someone said, okay, we're gonna do a hybrid event from the start, that we have pre-planned what kind of content goes into the online event. Maybe some parts are pre-recorded. You've got your MC, maybe you're working with an in-kind sponsor who is providing a lot of the camera work or the sound, the audio, the visual, what are those pieces that are going into it? But also saying, but we're going to have a handful of people that are in person. And for those people, um, maybe they're sponsors, they have to have paid at a certain level, and they're getting a really wonderful tailored in-person event. So if you're going into it like that, what makes the in-person event special? And then what makes the virtual event special? And making sure both have elements that are very, very engaging. The other thing coming out of the research for a virtual event, and it's one reason why we might say, hey, I don't want to do a virtual event, is that charging tickets for a virtual event seems to be 
yielding less than if we make the event free and do the fundraising in that virtual event. So if we're thinking about what should we do, should we do it, should we not, I do want you to keep in mind that um, if you have your virtual event and you don't charge any ticket price for it and you get people, quote unquote, in the room, in the virtual room, then that's a place where the fundraising happens. Um, of course, making sure you have sponsors with that too. And one thing about the virtual events, it is easier to direct um, attention to your sponsors. So there's lots of great things that you can be doing. But again, whether you're going in person, whether you're going virtual, whether you're doing hybrid, making sure you have very tight plans and backup plans is going to continue to be important. I'm wondering, um, you know, for those of you who are tackling in-person events this year, if you have any other questions about that or concerns. Okay, so let's keep going and really get into the actual goal setting. All right, so this is just a personal thing that I have about who should be setting fundraising goals. And it really comes from having been on staff um, as a development person, it's very common when an organization wants to stretch and grow is that they'll come to the development person and they'll say, we want you to raise double the amount of money you did last year. Or like, here's this really high fundraising goal. And there isn't a lot of thought behind it. So one of the things I always say is to create a fundraising goal, there's three things that go into it. One is vision, one is strategy, and another is resources. So if your vision for your organization, your strategy for your fundraising, and your resources for your fundraising are all the same as last year, then it's very predictable that your fundraising results will also be the same. And so rather than having someone handing down a fundraising goal, I think it's really important that we look at these three elements of vision, strategy, and resources. So let's start with vision. Um, if you are a fundraiser at your organization and not the executive director or on the board, you may not have very much to do with the vision. So it may be that you're being brought into all the meetings and you're an important part of setting the vision and you're part of those visionary conversations. Or it could just be that someone tells you this is the vision for the organization, now you need to fundraise. But the vision is usually coming through some combination of the executive director and the board. The strategy is often coming through some combination of your development department and your executive director. So maybe your executive director is some part of it, maybe not. If you are a smaller organization and you are the executive director and you're in charge of the fundraising and you're liaising with the board, you, have, you are part of more of those pieces. But you can see even in a much larger organization, the executive director is part of both the vision and then often some parts of the strategy. The larger the fundraising organization gets, or the larger the organization gets and more fundraising staff are there, the more the executive director um, might be stepping away from individual fundraising tactics and letting the department set those. The resources would then also be part of what the executive director and the board are thinking about. So if it's part of the fundraising budget. So as a fundraiser, you may need to come to your executive director or your board and talk about the resources that are needed to raise the money. So just again, thinking if vision is the same, strategy is the same and resources are the same, then your dollars coming in will likely be the same. So what we would wanna do is if we're looking to increase those goals, we're gonna look for some kind of change there. If you are the fundraiser on staff, you could be looking at saying, okay, well then, here are the other strategies that we would need to be doing and here are the resources that go with it. Um, or you can come back to your executive director and say, I see that you want us to raise this additional amount of money. What are we doing differently as an organization that I can bring to donors and talk to them about that they'd be excited about funding? Um, Cause that's another place that it can happen. So there needs to be a little bit more conversation rather than someone just handing a number to somebody and say, go raise this. Um, that is less likely to be successful. All right. 
I do think if all things being equal, the fundraisers can go to the executive director and the board and say, well, here's where I think the fundraising can go up in this next year using the strategies we're using. And unless, again, unless anything is really different, it's going to be probably just a little bit different in the amount of dollars coming in. So if having someone just hand a number down to somebody isn't as effective, I think the next thing is like, how do we set fundraising goals? How are we more effective? So one of the things I like to say is to start with a question. So rather than start with a number, start with a question. And this is where it's really good to kind of sit down. I think you want to figure out what is the question your organization is trying to answer. So maybe your organization is saying, how do we serve more kids? Or how do we expand to a second city? Or how do we acquire that building? So it might start at the organizational strategic level. It might start on the fundraising level. It might be something like, okay, someone's saying, how do we double our income? Starting with as a question rather than a number allows you to start to look at your resources and map them out. It allows you to start looking at your strategies and map them out. Another question could be, how could we get more high-level donors? Or, you know, I think this one is critically important and often overlooked. How do we retain more donors? If you're like the majority of nonprofits, you are retaining somewhere between 40 to 50% of your donors. It means you're losing more than half of your donors every year. And that's often hidden in our numbers because some donors are increasing their gifts, new donors are coming in, some people are joining um, monthly giving programs and, and all kinds of things happening that can obscure the fact that from the previous year to the next year, you've lost more than half of your donors. And so these are all things of starting with the question you wanna answer and then mapping it out can then start to go into your goals. The other thing, and I'm just gonna give you some free advice on this, this is something I tell all of my clients is that focus is critical. This is something that it, it really felt like it took me, you know, 10 to 15 years in the sector to understand because when I started in the sector, the message was really about diversifying income um, revenue sources. And while that is, it is important, you don't want to have all your, don your dollars coming in from one major donor or even from one income source. Um, the opposite of that, though, is to have every area of your fundraising targeted to grow. I can tell you having watched organizations over and over again use that strategy to grow their fundraising is that almost none of it will grow or the one area that they actually focused on will grow. I highly recommend that you pick one area to focus on and grow and keep all the other fundraising goals the same. And part of that is if you look at like human behavior and habits, it is really hard to change all of your habits. We're in January, we can say, oh, I'm gonna learn a new language and I'm going to lose weight, I'm gonna eat more fruits and vegetables, I'm gonna clean my house more, then I'm going to start you know, giving out food to the needy every Saturday, then I'm gonna do this. I can say that if that's where your focus is in all these different areas, within a few weeks, you're gonna kind of drift back to your regular habits, maybe you will take in one of those habits on and really done it. And so, because we use habits as a shortcut to keep ourselves moving forward, doing things more automatically. And one reason why the pandemic has been so painful is we can't rely on habits. We just have to keep reviewing things that used to be easy to make decisions. Looking at one area to have habit change around and growth and skills increasing and learning, that's how you're gonna be most effective at your fundraising goals. The other thing I would say, just having been in the sector for 20 years, is that as nonprofit employees, we just have so much heart we pour into our work. And it seems like the answer to everything is just to do more and work harder. And if I just stayed one more hour returning email at the office and, you know, my first nonprofit position was at a homeless shelter. And when I go to leave at five o'clock, I'd say, well, who doesn't get to eat? if I leave at five o'clock and so I'd stay till six o'clock and say, well, who's not gonna get to sleep if I leave at six o'clock and they'd stay to seven o'clock. And you can keep doing that till 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, but 
if we are not filling up ourselves as individuals, we are not going to be serving our constituents and our organization well. So I highly emphasize that do more, do more, do more is not the answer. And this is why there's so much burnout in our sector. So please pick one area for growth and really make a four quarter strategy for that one area. So let's talk about like, what are the different areas we could focus on that would make a difference in fundraising for the year? You could say, you know, my organization doesn't get major gifts. You know, we don't have a program around that. We've gotten a couple of donors who've given it a higher level because they're friends with a board member or because they like us. How do we create more of a structure and a system around major gifts? Could be a place to start, say this would be our focus. You could be saying, how do I get our event back on track after this, you know, two years of a pandemic? Could be another question. You might be saying, how do we start and develop our recurring or our monthly giving program? We know that other organizations are doing this. How do we do this? Um, I made the case for retaining donors. You could really actually spend a year on that. And I think one reason we don't retain donors as much is it's just not as attractive. We really orient our systems all towards acquisition. How do I get another donor, another donor, another donor? You can even think about how if you have a donor and that donor suddenly gives let's say a lot more and they just go up, people are less excited if you've noticed on your board or executive um, as they are if a totally new donor comes in and does that amount. And there's just something about the newness that feels more exciting and feels like we're accomplishing more, but it's really getting those current donors to stay and to increase is where the payoff is over time. We actually lose the majority of our donors between gift one and gift two. And if you can solve that problem, you will be working far less hard in your fundraising. You can go home at five o'clock and then you could be getting more dollars. So it's one thing I would really recommend making an area of focus. Developing your board. Um, I rarely ever meet an organization that does have something to say about how their board could be better. And I often meet board members who feel like the board could be better and they don't necessarily know what to do to make it better. So that's an area you could be looking at. And it's interesting as I was um, preparing for today, someone on our team pulled a lot of great trends and research in, in fundraising and nonprofits for 2022. And a couple of places it came up, and I thought this was a really interesting point, is nonprofits are often lagging behind in tech. And we know that. I think we often feel that pinch. We feel under-resourced. We feel like, oh, if only someone would just buy us a really expensive database or if we had someone who was updating our computers for us all the time. Um, but as I'm talking to other consultants recently, they've brought up the case that as nonprofits, because we're already behind in tech, it's actually making a bigger gap between the largest organizations and the smallest organizations. And then because we're already behind, it feels hard to jump in and figure out where to start and where to upgrade. So one goal I heard someone suggest was what if you just tried a new app or looked at a new technology once a quarter and you may look at it and decide, you know, we don't need this and it's fine, but at least you're aware of what it is, you know, you've evaluated it and you know, you don't want to use it. It still puts you in a better position than always feeling behind and not having the tech to support your work. And when you do have the tech behind your work, you can be faster and more efficient. I know that I've been slow to invest in this in time. Now we, um, we use a prospect researching software in our company to support our clients and it makes a big difference. You know, people that it would take 20 hours if you were to try to pull all the information from every annual report and figure these out, it's happening really quickly. So, you know, looking at what are those things that you can be looking at that can make a difference to make your organization tech could be one of those things. So I'm going to just stop there and just ask for questions and comments and see, you know, did anything land for you here? Did something come up where you thought, yeah, you know, we have been looking at recurring giving and we're not sure how to start or, you know, we have tried these things, but they haven't worked before. Does anyone want to share from their experiences or have questions for the group? I think this is Joy. I think um, what hit me is on the growth were 
I'm kind of their newest development person that they've had here and it's small. So they don't, when they told me they had donors, they hadn't tracked money coming in or anything. And so we got a donor management system and stuff. So now I can show them, you know, what they've done and what, so growth and being able to put it on there, where do you want to grow? I think is a great question for me to take as we go into the new year to my executive director, you know, like, cause I, they're all about wanting to pay more and pay more, but I'm like, people don't want to give to wages. We got to figure out another place to grow to where we can make that grow and, and the budget can be moved maybe for income, you know, or wages, all that, but growth, I think just really struck me. That's such a great point, Joy. And I really appreciate you sharing with the group and, and allowing everybody to learn from your experiences. And it's true, I have seen with organizations when they don't have the tracking in place. So there's levels of tracking, right? So, you know, you can go to one organization and they've got like an innovation and IT manager and they're doing, you know, multi-year expensive evaluations, right? And then some people like don't have a database. And what I've seen is um, with each level that we are increasing our tracking and our assessment of our fundraising, the better we are. If we're only ever tracking numbers of dollars, we actually don't know when we're succeeding or not. And I find this when I work with, let's say, if we're doing our year end, if you just say, you throw it all in a big lump and you say, wow, our year end, I'm just going to throw out an example, our year end raised $40,000. But if you don't know how much of it came in from a letter, how much of it came in from email one versus email 10, you don't know whether your new text to give worked. You don't know... Um, whether the phone call from your board member worked. If we can't figure out which of the things that work, we don't know which parts of the plan to keep doing. And I'd say for nonprofit and the amount of staff time we have, which of the things we can stop doing. Right. I was working with an organization and we were doing more and more and more and more. And I got to a point where I was like, oh, those we've gone so early now in our campaign that the first couple emails are not bringing in as much money anymore. We can just cut them now. But it took like, assessing and testing and doing each year till we got to the point of this is the thing that doesn't bring in money and these are the things that do and so you're totally right and I find with um with databases and systems for instance um I'm working with a client that doesn't have a system it takes a long time actually to figure out what worked and didn't work so we're pulling from the email system we're pulling from the spreadsheet we're pulling from the budget and it's hard to get a full picture then if you have a system where you can just open it and look at the dashboard and say, okay, you know, here's the open rate for our donors and here's how many people upgraded their gift this year. And this is how many people decreased their gift or didn't give from last year. So great job, Joy. It sounds like you're moving your organization in the right direction. Thank you. Any other questions or thoughts before we move to the next slide? Okay. All right, so some of us are excellent at making goals and not as excellent in completing those goals. So I would say that on a personal level, I was one of those people that I would go into the year and I would have my pages of goals and one page for every area of my life. And then each page had 10 goals on it and I was gonna do this great year. And it is true you know, by February, March, April, I definitely had not completed those goals. And I think for, in some cases, one of the things that can happen is 12 months is a long time to conceptualize. And so how do we take these goals we set for our organization and bring them into something that is usable and completing, that you're able to complete within that 12 month time frame? So I'm going to tell you some of the things I notice when people get off target in goals, whether they're really personal goals or they are professional goals. In an organization or personally, when there isn't a regular cadence of accountability. Now, I will tell you, I, like many people, have hated the term accountability. To me, it sounded like either someone who's going to make me feel bad if I didn't do it or that friend, or we're gonna keep each other accountable, but by week four, we're just meeting for coffee and we're forgiving each other for everything we didn't do. And then we stop finding the meetings valuable and we don't talk about it. And so it's easy to avoid accountability 
but it's like those organizations where you you create you go through this big process and you create a strategic plan with your board and it's this amazing document and it sits on a shelf the thing that stops it from sitting on the shelf is making it part of your daily and your weekly and your monthly activities. There has to be some way in which you're checking in the progress towards those goals as a team. And it can't be something where you're making each other feel bad for it um, because I think bad feelings actually, um, there's this great line from a parenting book that I love, which is why do we think that making people feel bad will make them do good? Um, so. It, same for yourself and your team with goals, making each other feel bad is not going to work, but looking at what the obstacles are to a goal is. If you can say, wow, we really got pulled off target when that board member asked us to do another cultivation event. Was that successful? Was that really what we should have done? In which case, good for us. I'm glad we did that instead of following the plan we had. Or are we not having enough structures that allow us to stay on target for our plan? So when you can look at that, when you would have that regular accountability, it will make it easier for you to keep in the goals. And particularly when you're looking at it from a diagnostic standpoint, what's working, what's not working, not how are we good, how are we bad? If that's the question, I can tell you, you will avoid accountability um, because who wants to be told they're doing something badly? But if you're really looking for how do we keep moving forward, having that accountability in your team, having those bigger goals and not just the the short-term goals brought in front of your team will keep it top of mind. I did a goals exercise even with my kids who are 10 and six. And I suddenly realized, I said, where did those goal papers go? If we don't have them up on our wall, how are we gonna remember to practice ukulele every day? How are we gonna remember that we wanted to learn to write a story this year? We're not because it's buried in a sheet of papers. So that goes for anybody, right? Even 10 and six year olds. Um, I talked about this last one, but I'm gonna say it again, too many goals, too many goals will make you not achieve your goals. And I had a boss who used to say this, if everything is a priority, then nothing is a priority. And it took me a long time to really get what she's saying because I am a perfectionist and I'm like, no, everything has to be perfect, but she's right. If we're working on everything, it's really not gonna work. Um, one of the things, there's some great psychology around goal setting. Goals that are too high are are demotivating. So again, if somebody came from, if the board handed down and said, you're going to make, you know, an extra 200,000 this year out of nowhere, we don't know where it's coming from. And we didn't give you resources. And we didn't tell you how there's no extra staff person. There's no extra technology and there's no different plan. You are going to want to stop looking at that goal. And every time you do look at it, your stomach is going to drop because you're not going to know how to achieve it. Even if that goal is too high, maybe it's something like going and getting a mentor at a larger organization and finding out how do we tackle this larger goal. But something, there has to be something in place to help you get to it. Um, goals not owned by the entire organization. So again, if somebody set the goals and dropped them off, um, I realized I was about to do that to my own team here at the nonprofit coach that I was really excited about sales goals for this year and things we're gonna do. And I stopped myself and I said, don't go to your team and say, hey guys, we're gonna make all this more money. We're gonna do all these things. That's not gonna be exciting. Talk to them about your ideas and we're gonna come together and let them help set some of the targets. Let them say, I'd like us to make this much. I'd like our clients to be happier. I'd like this to happen. Let it come as part of your team. So if not everybody owns the goal, that I can guarantee that not everybody will be fighting for the goal. And, you know, I know some of you probably experience this. If it's a fundraising goal, there is a tendency to say, hey, you fundraisers over there, go make the money. We're going to do the virtuous work over here of working with the kids or solving the societal problem, or we're going to be working on strategy. And when fundraising is siloed off, it, it is much less effective. And the organizations that all own fundraising and believe that everybody is part of making a viable functioning organization are the ones that are most effective. So this goes into the idea of no real buy-in for the goals. Um, and I've talked about no additional resources. I look back now and it just never occurred to me. And I think it is that nonprofit martyr mindset when goals would go up, it never occurred to me to say, hey, you know, 
how will we achieve this? What other dollars are we putting to this higher goal? Is it another staff person? Is it some technology? I just kept thinking I had to have a genius strategy. I had to work harder. Um, and then if I made the goal, I could have the extra staff person. And, you know, I think that question is important. And resources can be staff. They can be time. They can be software. They could be training, right? Maybe you just need more skills. Um, no real strategy. So maybe there's no strategy at all. Then um, the other thing I would also say to look at is people playing outside of their strengths. One thing about fundraising is one, not everybody likes it, right? <laughs> but two, there's all different kinds of fundraising, right? There's extroverted fundraising in which you're getting in front of people. If you're a social person, that's going to be exciting to you. There's like more introverted fundraising. You're at a desk and maybe you're crafting the best grant proposal or you're researching donors or you're writing the best direct mail appeal. All of that is really great. Um, but sometimes we get stuck when we're a fantastic grant writer, but all of a sudden we know we have to be meeting with people every week or we're meeting with people all the time and we're planning the events and someone's like, wow, you need to start going after foundations and the thought of sitting at your computer all day makes you want to kill yourself. Um, if that is the case, um, you're going to need to give yourself some more grace and you're going to need to look at who can be part of this team, maybe, hopefully. You can hire somebody like someone from my team. Maybe you can get an expert volunteer from somebody else. Maybe a board member is willing to spend a certain number of hours per week or month to work on a type of fundraising for you. But if you find that a particular type of fundraising is horrifying for you, don't just keep beating your head against the wall. I really recommend that you have someone else do that. We really done our team. There's someone on our team and anything has to do with people, she wants to call people, she wants to meet with people, she wants to train people. And we have another person on our team, anything that's writing, anything that's research, she wants to do that. It's been really great to divide up the work if it comes out, if it doesn't evenly fit in any one person's job, we kind of look at what is someone interested in and we can divide it between them. So please, if you're finding yourself not wanting to do a type of fundraising, um, please find someone else to help you with that and get it off your plate. I can guarantee it's not gonna go well as it is. Uh, you know, as a someone who has been a solopreneur and a building out my team, I've had to do that with myself and say, I'm just not good at certain types of things and that need to go to a different person. Okay, so we're going to stop here and we're going to have some questions and then I want to guide you through some, through some, I'm going to leave space for you to ask questions, but I want to guide you through some questions as you think about your fundraising goals for the year. So tell me what's coming up for you now as you've been hearing these different ways of looking at approaching fundraising goals. Hi, um, my name is Nikki. Um, I am a fundraiser, but I am an introvert. Um, yeah. So I am very happy that you brought that up because I do, um, I am more of a emailing kind of person but I don't really like like a uh, physical interaction with uh, with um, with potential donors so sometimes I feel like these emails they don't really work that much they are not very efficient compared to um, in person like um, interactions so I don't know so for someone like me when I am um, trying to attract potential donors or reach out to foundations. Um, how can I do it in a way that, well, I can imagine also um, having to try and get out of my comfort zone a bit. I am open to doing that, but what is, uh, I don't know, like what is the best way to actually attract new donors? Thanks. This is a great question. I'm so glad you brought that up. And I, I just want to say for all the introverts out there, introverts make great fundraisers. So please don't let anyone make you feel like you can't do the work because you don't want to be meeting people in front of, in front of them all the time. Um, so let's break this question into a few different pieces. One of the things I would say is that um, introverts are actually known for being fantastic listeners. And so when you can be one-on-one -on -one with a donor, you may actually have an advantage over the extrovert who may at first seem really flashy and people maybe are loving being with them, 
but maybe you're more likely to listen to what their actual needs are. You might be better at coming back and doing the follow-up with them about what they said that they wanted. Um, so don't discount your ability to be in those social situations and be effective. That's one thing I would say. Um, another I would say is I wonder if there's someone in your circle who could be a partner with you. If you look at major gift fundraising, that's often um, more effective with more than one person anyway. Um, usually somebody someone else might be more comfortable um, describing the programs in detail or they have all the facts or the metrics memorized about the organization. And so people can play different roles in those meetings. And so I don't know if you have a fantastic board member who can go with you on those meetings or who can make the initial contact. Um, I also will say, you know, don't discount um, sometimes lower level staff. Um, depending on the structure of your organization. When I first came into nonprofit fundraising, I had come from an acting background. And even though I was the lowest person on the totem pole at that organization, they put me in charge of going out and speaking to organizations. They had a really well-developed organizational story and facts. And so I would go into companies, I would give speeches, I was like traveling around doing that. And I was only 20 two or however old we are when we come out of college. So, you know, you may have somebody who's in your circle who can handle some of the more extroverted work that helps bring in those prospects and becomes part of that pipeline for then you to meet with them. So that's another um, thing that you can do is like using the people around you to help take some of that off your plate and then making sure you're there for some of those really important asks and that you're helping to guide it. Um, so that's another part. When we look at effectiveness, you know, it's tricky because there's all different parts that go into attracting new donors. If you're talking about emails, as in those email appeals that we're sending out, um, it is an important part of the engagement strategy. But sometimes people mistake that like a one-off email is going to bring in a lot of dollars or bring in a lot of new donors. And that is not the case. Um, we know that we have to communicate with donors through multiple channels, multiple times um, to create the greatest impact with them. We need to be engaging them through social media. We need to be asking through email. We need to be having in-person conversations with them. And we know that those in-person conversations and phone conversations really bring the donor closer to your organization. So it really does take a mix. Um, when organizations are looking to go and increase um, the number of donors that are there. There's a whole process that we go through with organizations where we help them figure out their targets, um, help them research them, and help them bring it in. So it depends on what kind of donors you want it through and what kinds of, yeah, what kinds of donors and in what ways you want to be getting them is, is a kind of a more long and nuanced answer, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> um, but great, great question. Other questions? Okay, so we're gonna stay here and I want you to pull out pen and paper if you have it, um, or you know, pull out your um, computer and pull up your word processing and you can start typing. But I'm gonna ask a series of questions. And so as you're looking at, if you're gonna focus on a particular area of fundraising in 2022, I'm gonna ask some questions to help you narrow down what that focus could be and where you might have the greatest um, value. So. The first question I want to ask you, if you've got your pen and paper, is what is one area that if your organization improved in fundraising would make the biggest difference to your organization's success? So there might be an area that you've been thinking about that you're like, man, if we could just do this, I don't really know how or who or anything like that, but if we could achieve this one area of fundraising, I know it would make a big difference for the organization. Just give me a thumbs up if you feel like you've answered that question for yourself today. All right, we're getting. 
getting a couple of thumbs up here. Okay, we're going to keep moving forward, um, but feel free to keep answering that question for yourself um, as we go ahead. All right, next question. What is one area of your work that bothers you? Maybe it never reaches its goal or staff always complain about it um, or you just feel it could be better. So looking there like your gut feelings, your emotional intelligence, what's caught a pain point for you and your organization? This is a little different than thinking, oh, if we could just do this. Give me a thumbs up if you've answered that question. And you may find it's the same as the earlier one or it may not. All right, we're getting some thumbs up. Great. Ooh, I got bigger. All right, next question. All right, I purposely made this number not too big. I would say, and not too small. If someone gave you a $20,000 grant to spend on fundraising, what would you spend it on? This is getting a little bit more into that resources area and maybe can help clarify the answers to questions one and two. So someone gives you $20,000 for fundraising. For us, it would be for us, it would be yeah. a capital campaign. They want us to do a new building, so I think I would use that twenty thousand to be able to use for um, a company outside company to help us. But the you know the stuff, the process it takes to do a capital campaign, and you know the books, and you know to getting resources out there to connect with donors, big time donors. I think and travel and all that stuff I think would come into that. So that'd be huge for us. Yeah, that's a great point. And a lot of times for organizations, um, it, you know, even organizations that have multiple paid staff fundraisers going into a capital campaign will bring in an outside council because it is a lot of additional work that goes with it and other processes. And you still have all the other fundraising you still have to do. It's, nobody says to you, oh, you're in a capital campaign. You don't have to do an event this year, you know? <laughs> or yeah. you're in a capital campaign. You just forget that part, right? So um, it's really great. And hopefully when you're working with someone for your capital campaign, you're also growing your own skills and maybe your staff, you know? So that might be something to be looking at, but I think that's a great example. Does anyone want to share something before we move to the next question? Yeah, go ahead, Terry. So um, I would say paid advertising, like social media. Um, from what we've seen this last Giving Tuesday in our first time paying for uh, sponsored ads, that it increased our reach. Um, we're a younger agency, only 11 years old, but we were hanging with the big boys, people who have twice as many followers, but our engagement for the first time has uh, up theirs. Um, and we saw that giving uh, increased. Uh, our giving to save numbers topped theirs for the first time ever, um, wow. you know, small but mighty. Um, and we only invested $50 uh, wow. for Tuesday. So giving $20,000 throughout a year, um, promoting our powerful stories of our shelter and our outreach team, I think would, would just go miles to spreading the word of our agency throughout our region. That's fantastic. Thanks for sharing that, Terry. And I think everybody can get something out of that, right? All right, let's do one more, actually no, two more questions. Okay. So this question is, is 
there an area of fundraising you love more than the others that offers a lot of um, promise? So it could be something that this is a natural fit with your own skills or your staff skills. It might be something that like you love meeting with donors and you love hearing about their stories or you just love crafting the best appeal or, you know, I always say like, give me four hours in a spreadsheet. I feel like I've just come out of a bubble bath. You know, that's just one of those things that just, I feel good doing it. I like doing it. Um, so look at what those things are. They might be something too, that maybe every year you've had growth or something really surprising and exciting came out of it. Like Terry shared, it's like, wow, all we did was spend $50 and we had this great impact on social media. So next, I just want you to write something that feels really good in fundraising that looks like it could be promising. And go ahead and give a thumbs up when you've um, written that one down. Great. Excellent. Got a couple more here. Right. Um, I'm going to put in another plug for retaining your donors. <laughs> what percentage of your 2020 donors did you renew in 2021? Now, you may have that answer right at your fingertips because you're looking at it all the time. And if you don't, I highly recommend that you go back and you look at that because um, that might be a really strong place where without a lot of time, effort, and money, you could be really increasing the dollars that are staying in your organization. So that's just another place like I would suggest that you look. So I'm wondering if we've gone through these guided questions, if anything has come up for you that you're starting to sense a theme, some of the questions tilted more negatively towards things that were pain points and bothered you a lot. So we can increase our areas of weakness to find growth. Some of these were focused towards our strength. We could actually just keep going with our strengths and find growth that way, right? There's nothing that says we just have to be perfect in all areas. We can really focus and do really well at a particular area. So I'm wondering for everybody, what came up for you and did anything, um, did anything surprise you or did anything help confirm something you felt? For me, it's the retention of first time donors. Mm. That is the hardest thing to do. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's universal across no matter what you do um, in the field. It's uh, retaining those people who give one time um, yeah. and figuring out why they gave. Um, you know, whether it's them looking, finding you on Facebook or online or recommendation from a friend, but having. How do you turn them into a second time giver, a third time giver, a fourth time giver? Um, you know, um, it's 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 easier to retain them than finding someone else new. So the goal is to retain that person. Um, and that's where I struggle the most. Um, uh, I've only been in my job since October. So I'm still kind of new at this, even though I've been <laughs> agency for a couple of years. But um, that's where I, I'm trying to learn the, the most I can about. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a place I would say is like a good place to put on your like curiosity hat. I think a lot of times we lose people between gift one and gift two because we don't know our donors well enough. Like you kind of said, like, I don't know what made them decide to leave. I don't really know what made them give. Um, and if we know the answers to those questions, I think it is easier to keep them. And so then that makes me look and say, well, how would I get the answers to those questions? So what process could I put in place? Um, what needs am I meeting when they make the donation? And what needs am I not meeting when they don't make the second donation? Um, those are all like things that, these are the questions I would be asking to start to get that plan in place. And then I'm a really big fan of experimentation. You know, so test things, figure out what's working and not working and, and know, um, by the way, sometimes we throw a bunch of solutions at a problem and we don't know which was the one that worked. We don't know if any of it worked. We didn't know if they would have come back a second time anyway. Um, so really looking at it scientifically, I think will help you a ton. Thanks for sharing, Terry. I really appreciate that. Anyone else want to share before we close up? 
I think uh, for me, my takeaway is that, I'm, I mean, I just realized that as I said previously that I'm an introvert and for me, I'm really, really good at progress, um, rep- like um, drafting progress report, drafting proposals, funding requests. These are really the areas where I'm very good at, but um, so I am good at retaining um, existing donors and making sure that they keep staying because I think also like um, updating them on the progress of the report of the project where they um, gave money to that is also another way of really retaining the existing donors so my bigger issue was actually to find new donors so that's where I struggled with because um um, as I previously said, I sometimes don't really want to um, physically interact with them. I will just want to find ways, like different kind of engagement through emails or whatever other ways. So now I know that in order for me um, to still be able to find new donors, I need to, um, yeah, just partner with, collaborate with my coworkers who are very good at um who are extroverts and i yeah i'm very thankful that i learned a lot through this um uh this event thanks a lot oh that's great i'm so glad to hear that and i think you're right and that person could be a program person um whoever it is yeah that that's really fantastic and i bet your coworkers and colleagues are so delighted that you're good at those reports and you're getting those done and the follow up is strong and and you know when we're good at something sometimes we're so good at something we can't even see that we're good at it it's just like oh yeah that's what people do that's just the right thing and then when we're bad at something we're struggling and we're struggling like oh why can't i do this it's just like oh forgive yourself move on get someone else to help <laughs> because if you give up your if you spend so much time on your weaknesses, you can actually kind of lose your strengths. Your strengths and your weaknesses really are interrelated. And so, you know, we don't need to be perfect at everything. That is my message. All right. Let's see if I can move this on to the next slide. All right. So I'm going to stop share for a moment here and reshare if I can. Give me a moment here. All right, well, it is not wanting to move on to the next screen, but so thank you all for being here today. I really appreciate your honesty, um, being able to dive into the things that you're working on, what's important to you. I hope that you see that you're also inspiring the other people that are here. You're helping them to think differently about their work. A lot of times we're, really stuck into our own organization and our own work and we don't get a chance to inspire others and be inspired because we're you know saving children or whatever it is that we're doing so i really appreciate that i hope that you'll think of the nonprofit coach for your services for coaching for um strategic planning board training anything like that so thank you so much for being here and feel free to reach out thank you so much Thanks. Bye. Yes, thank you so much, Elizabeth.